Are you doing the intro or am I doing the intro? I, you know, I think you should start the intro because your name is on the podcast mm -hmm. and then I will, I'm sure, interrupt you at some stage and take over the intro. You're very good at that. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is Darlene my the the co-host of today's episode or, or eventually the actual host uh, is david van daff i've invited back to the show to celebrate last week was one year the first birthday of better than fine and this will be the 50th episode hooray and i thought okay what special different thing could we do and a number of fans of the show have been asking for a flip around where someone interviews me because people wanted to know more about me for some ungodly reason. And I thought, who do I know that will ask interesting questions, be a good anchor host, uh, and also be kind of funny, but respectful enough <laughs> to not directly <laughs> insult me on the internet. And that's why I asked David back. It is a pleasure to be on. Congratulations on the one year anniversary. I didn't realize and yes, I did. plenty of adjectives have been used to describe me over time and being short winded is not one of them. No, I've got plenty of questions and I'm sure we're going to have a great conversation getting to know Darlene better. Oh, Jesus. Better than fine. <laughs> what did you call it uh, a couple of weeks ago? You interrupted Better than me? Show. Yeah, better than, better? <laughs> better than you. No, I think it was better than you. Better than you. <laughs> better than you. Uh, no, that is not the name of the show. Um, yeah, no one's ever called me a short one did either so that's why we're friends i guess yeah. um but yeah it was weird there was a lot of weird things that happened this time last year but one of them was i launched the show and then like two weeks later the the world i had all these plans of like all these people is going to interview and i do i have them over to do it or do it like how is that going to work and um all these topics i wanted to cover and then none of it was relevant for like six months it totally changed True. the direction of the show True. because everything changed True. um but it was good in some ways, good timing, I think, for a show about how to take care of yourself and build a good life. I have seen more podcasts, fitness related podcasts, fitness wellness, I should say, launched over the past 12 months than I had seen in three or four years prior. Because everybody so think, had free time. <laughs> I, I think so. I, I think more people um, have an opportunity to throw on a headset and, and listen, as opposed to being with clients continually throughout the day or, you know, running around in their normal everyday life, it, it's given them that opportunity. Um, so fewer people, let's say in cars, listening to podcasts, I know quite a few that do that, but certainly more opportunities, more walks around the neighborhoods, more um, you know, look, looking for some form of entertainment. So I think it's a good thing. I think that's the other reason I asked you on is because you're like a podcast guy. You listen to lots of podcasts, so you'll have a strong opinion about what is good podcasting. I, I, like I, I and I share quite a bit of them. I I started listening to podcasts. I'll bet you at six, seven years ago now, and mm -hmm. it was simply a result of I would record me. I would you know put together music mixes, etc., and have them in the gym and run with them, different things to that degree, and. I just found myself after a couple of times, like wanting to continually switch that up. And I was also getting to a point where music that I really liked, I was listening too much in the morning. And I don't know how I first figured it out, but, but somebody had spoken about, it. I was listening to somebody and they had mentioned a podcast. So I didn't know what it was and recorded it. And I had it on, you know, the little iPod and then listened to it in the gym. And it really, really kept me engaged on the treadmill, much more so than music. And so I just thought, well, I would listen to that one podcast whenever it launched. And then that spawned into another podcast. And I think I've got probably 40 or 50 that I keep somewhat track of. And um, I've loved it. Absolutely yeah. loved it. Yeah, I think we're on similar timelines. Uh, I've always been these last, I think, yeah, seven, eight years. For yeah. me, it was the subway. Yeah. I'd have to pull music down or whatever onto the subway and have 40, 45 minutes of just right. I would listen to a lot of this American life and storytelling yeah. is always big. And this is supposed to be about me, Dave. Why are we talking about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start by saying Arrogant. this. You and I got connected probably close to, I don't know, what are we, six, seven months or, or a little bit longer. Um, I've worked in the fitness industry for, I think I'm on my 26th year in the industry. Ooh. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there, there are plenty of, uh, examples that I've shown over time in terms of the length, the span that I've been in the industry. But when I first started, 
in the health club industry, personal training was widely viewed as an unprofitable service, or it was really positioned as something that would uh, uh, only be for a, um, a very minimal demographic of society, and that would be primarily celebrities, athletes, et cetera. And you know, we've seen the growth and development progressively over time. There have been things that it, within our industry that have changed exponentially, and there are other things that haven't, and, and some of which is you know, sedentary lifestyles and obesity and, and a variety of different things that we haven't made a big dent in, even though we've evolved the industry quite a bit, which we'll, we'll talk about as we go on. But um, we have a mutual friend uh, that, uh, Darlene, you had gone to graduate school with. Who has who been on I, the show twice. That's right. Jody Wellman, who I had worked with in the industry for quite a few years. We got introduced um, which started as a initial conversation to talk a bit about our backgrounds and get to know each other um, has led into a pretty regular stream of conversations that you know, range throughout the industry. And um, you come from a very interesting perspective and an area in our business. I somewhat similar in terms of coming from a, a different background, ultimately to find my way into the industry. And it's led into a variety of different great conversations progressively over time. So And a lovely friendship, I would say. Very true. I would agree. I would agree. It's been really helpful for me, I would say, as well as, as you and I have talked about, I have been, I have worked hands-on in health clubs for a big portion of my career. Um, I've also spent a considerable amount of time outside of the clubs, but dealing with the industry, dealing with personal trainers, health club owner operators, just everybody across the board in fitness. And, and I also, for me, it's always been helpful because I'm not engaged with clients and um, uh, folks that are looking to improve their fitness and wellness on a, on a regular everyday uh, level. So it's, it's, I, I always appreciate talking to somebody who is engaged with clients rather than making assumptions on what folks need and where the industry is headed, talking to people on the ground. So that's always been helpful. Oh, I'm happy to be helpful. <laughs> shall we, shall we Which, get to it? Yeah, let's get to it. And, and I think the best question, if I were to describe as we talk about our relationship and your role in fitness, um, my first question would be, how would you define yourself? Are you a, are you a coach? Are you a trainer? What, what do you describe yourself when somebody asks what your career, your profession is? Um, that is a question. That is a conversation that I have probably weekly with yes. various colleagues and friends and um, curious onlookers because I don't have a great answer. Um, I, when Rich Ritchie, I'm trying to remember, I think I was on I was on the NASM PT podcast or when he was on my show, I don't remember which, which one we were talking about. He defines himself as a personal trainer, but he's got a PhD and he's got like four degrees and he's an entrepreneur. He does all the other stuff, but he just defines himself as a personal trainer. Um, and that to me resonated, but what, what I find is that when I define myself as a personal trainer and then I get talking to people about what I do, there's this moment of like, you're not a personal trainer. <laughs> I'm like, well, yes. And like, I'm a personal trainer. I'm a wellness coach. I'm a podcast host. I um, am a writer. I'm a content creator. So I don't, and I think that we're finding this in a lot of people with these intersectional professions, these holistic professions where we don't know what to call ourselves because there isn't a good word for when you stand in the middle. Yeah. So I help people, I help people who have typically people who have stuff, like you've got something going on, whether it's in your physical self or your psychological self, that's like blocking you from, from doing the good, the good thing you want to be doing in life. Uh, and I do it in a variety of ways. I do it one-on-one. -on -one. I teach corporate workshops. So, I, so I'm also a facilitator and a speaker. Um, and, you know, I, I speak at conferences. I have a fair amount of authorship and content creation. And so I, try to produce a variety of things in a way that if you were someone who let's say the pandemic ruined your income and life is hard now and there's just no way on god's green earth that you're going to hire a trainer or a coach there's still good information out there for you accessible in a way that you can consume it and that's a big part of why i do the show mm -hmm. um but i don't it means i don't have an easy answer yeah and because a lot of what i do is also 
idea generation. Like where do, where do I not only think the industry is going, where do I think the fitness and wellness spaces should be going? Yeah. And how do I create that thing? Because uh, there is, you know, you alluded to this in the intro, there's a lot we're getting wrong and there's so much we could be offering that we're not because we have so many contact hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to see that grow. And I don't think I did a good job of answering your question, but I'd say it depends on who I'm talking to. Yeah. Um, if I'm talking to a potential client, I say I'm a positive, I say I'm a, a personal trainer who offers wellness coaching and I have a master's degree in positive psychology. And then I explain mm-hmm. what that is. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm talking to a positive psychology practitioner, I typically just say, well, I'm a, I've had 10 years in the fitness industry and I host this podcast yeah. um, because it's always contextually relevant as I'm sure that you've experienced in your life. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And, and, you know, I also believe that, that part of what makes this a challenge is, is once again, the evolution of the profession and the industry, what a personal trainer provided 15 years ago is different than it is today. What you are, are providing your clientele and, and you talk about where you want to see this industry grow is, is quite different than what the majority of folks provided even five years ago for that matter. So I think that does make that a challenge. People want to brand the profession. Oh, you count reps and you grab dumbbells for clients and you help them lose weight progressively, which is obviously we've talked about this. You're providing a heck of a lot more. And I think it makes it a little bit challenging when you're talking about what you do and what you provide. I think I was really lucky. So you know, 10 years ago or whenever I was hired, I, I was hired into, into a box gym, into a corporate gym, mm-hmm. um, luxury fitness in lower Manhattan, very sexy, very like, you're paying to sweat next to celebrities and models. And, but, but there was this, you know, cream that had risen to the top of that particular location of people who had been in the fitness industry for 20 years. One, one guy, um, he's in his fifties now and he entered the fitness industry when he was 19. Um, he was my mentor. Mm -hmm. And so they really showed me what a career trainer could be like, right? You're always learning. You're always trying to be better for yourself and your clients. You're always applying the next, the next thing first to yourself. And then how do you get it into the the people who are, uh, you're providing a service to, there was a strong emphasis on service. There was a strong emphasis on community. Um, unfortunately that community did not, uh, sustain due to corporate interference, but at least it gave me the foundation and the target Um, and the guidance very early in my career that led me to the mindsets that I have now. Okay. And when you think about clientele, let's go back even, even thinking about traditional personal training or where personal training once was, it was always focused towards one, one of two goals, right? It was losing weight or, uh, which you could put in the cliche of tone and firm into oh, that section or, or the small demographic of folks that were looking to, let's say, gain size or increase athletic performance. Tell me about what, what you see today in terms of clients wants and needs, what are expressed and then also, you know, what are those inner drives? What, what are the, um, uh, the compelling reasons that, that lead them down this pathway of working with you? Yeah. So I always, I used to manage within that same company. Um, and I would take my, I'd teach my baby trainers as I was teaching them how to be, you know, industry successful. That I think the industry identifies three categories of goals. So you hit aesthetics on the head, right? Mm-hmm. Lose weight, gain mass, look, look good in your underwear. Mm-hmm. Um, performance. So I've got a race, I've got a competition, I've got, you know, whatever. Uh, And I do think that depending on the age and what's going on with somebody's life, there is a health component. And by that, I only mean physiological health, like what's happening in my physical vessel. Mm -hmm. What I think that we're seeing, and I think it was always there. I think we just didn't have a vehicle or a language to talk about it, but the pandemic really accelerated this conversation is people who are like, I just want to feel good. Mm -hmm. And that's the gap that I think there's this whole body of evidence around the emotional response, the neurochemical response to movement and to the interpersonal connections that can be built through physical activity. 
uh, and the way that you can structure physical activity to cause these neurochemical, social, and emotional reactions in a human being where they feel better. Mm -hmm. But we don't talk about it. We don't know how to coach it. We don't know how to write for it. We don't know how to program it. And because of that, hardcore fitness people are like, yeah, runner's high. Yeah, achievement high. Woo. But you mentioned in the intro that we have this you know, subset of the population who is sedentary and who is obese. And that is only growing in response to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. They don't believe us. And if they do our workouts, they don't feel that thing that we feel because their physiology is in a completely different place. Mm -hmm. So if you don't meet them where they are and find the way to make it work for their vehicle of their physical self, they don't get the same thing we get. And we, we as an industry suck at that. So yeah. I think the gap is really like this new horizon of um, Kelly McGonigal has a book called The Joy of Movement, which is all about the science of this for anybody who cares. Um, but if we can tap into this concept of fitness for well-being or fitness for wellness, which to me is a completely different lens than programming exclusively to produce a physiological adaptation, which is what we know how to do somewhat. We're not very good at weight loss. We claim to be good at weight loss, but we're not. Yeah. What, um, I mean, this, this is a loaded question. But, Hit me. <laughs> well, you, you think about, we talk about movement and we talk about achieving goals and, and you had mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, there's no shortage of content, no. right? And, and, and a Google search will tell you, will give you a million different workout programs and a million different diets, million different philosophies, um, et cetera, et cetera. So th 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 no, nobody can go forth and say, well, I just don't know how to go about doing it. I disagree. I disagree Tell strongly okay. because, all right. Um, I think of immediately think of members of my family who mm -hmm. they're even paying people for programming and they can't do the exercise prescription without harming themselves. And they're like, okay, I must be broken or I'm doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, this doesn't feel good. And the fitness professional is going, no, no, you're fine. Keep going. Um, and because that fitness professional, and I put that in soft quotes, doesn't understand that the person in front of them isn't ready for the shit they're throwing at them. I, I agree. And uh, that person then leaves defeated, believing that fitness is just not for them. And so there is a lot of, I Google and I still don't know what to do. And I can't tell you how many clients that I have had to teach them the structure of a tri set so that they can write their own workouts, even though they'd been training a trainer for paying a trainer for a decade before they worked with me and had no idea what to do in the gym. And this is the answer to the question, because really what I was leading into is people can get information on how to move, right? There's no shortage of hey, you should do the following, do the following 10 exercises, eat the following, do the following routine, and you're going to look like me. And so folks have access to that, but it really leads into what the problem is. And the problem, which you're identifying, is the fact of it's, it's not one size fits all. And if you give somebody who has been sedentary for three or four years a routine that involves lunge walks and plyo box jumps and a variety of different things that they're pulling off of Instagram or pulling off of um, uh, there's some type of content hub, a blog, for instance, now you've got problems and issues. And I when I talk about it, go one layer deeper on that, oh. because what you said in the, in, as you're setting that statement up was do the following and you will look like me. Mm -hmm. That is the wrong statement to begin with. Mm -hmm. It, I don't, I don't ever want to produce anything that puts out to the internet look like me. You want to be like me. No, uh -huh. you want to be the version of yourself that wakes up in the morning and you're happy to be alive and yeah. you're excited to get out of bed and you get to do cool shit that day and you have fun while you're doing it. You have good relationships that feel good, a sense of purpose and meaning in the 24 hours that you get to live again. And none of that has anything to do with how I look in my underwear. Mm -hmm. And if we as an industry continue to perpetuate this idea that, oh, you just want to look like us, we're going to keep making people miserable, mm -hmm. which is, which really leads to the point, which is, <laughs> isn't that somewhat of the problem? We've been yes. doing this same pattern for a considerable period of time. The obesity rates, the sedentary lifestyles, the chronic disease issues, all of those are not changing. If anything, they're getting worse. worse. 
the so when you look at it and you try and put your finger on okay it's not a matter of knowing something to do it's a matter of what they're getting access to the motivations that come along with it and i think darlene you also go with the the, the, the mindset of so many is, boy, I want six pack abs and I want to look like this person. But ultimately, the, the underlying goal um, and, and drive here is feeling better, right? And, and people are putting the, uh, the, the thought pattern of, if I lose 20 pounds, I would feel great all day long. I'd look good. I'd feel good. This would change my life. So they're putting the scale weight they're putting the aesthetic image um, in the place of feeling better, increasing wellness, um, holistic wellness, which we'll talk about here in a second because I want to I want to know more about that from your perspective. But I think that's part of the problem, and 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 we're also giving them a roadmap so very often that they're not going to achieve what those aesthetic goals are. They're go that's going to lead to frustration ultimately, and and there's no there's no feeling better as part of that model. Yeah. Well, and to that point, I believe very strongly that the hormonal effects of the kind of stress that comes when you don't like yourself and you're mm -hmm. having a bad time, keep people in that physiological state that they're trying to get mm -hmm. out of. Mm -hmm. And I can think of a few times in my career and it's been really sad where I've helped the person check all the boxes, the weight came off, they were still miserable. So they went right back to the same coping mechanisms. Yeah. And if we are not encouraging our clients to find ways to heal, whatever that is, that's making them unhappy emotionally, the neurochemical state isn't going to change and mm -hmm. they aren't going to, we're not crafting a lifestyle that, that is aligned with them. And then it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Cause they're going to go right back. I mean, they go right back for so many reasons, but it's hard. It's hard to be, to watch somebody do that sure. because they're unhappy. But I think what, what one of the positive elements of coming out of this pandemic is going to be is probably more focused towards that comprehensive view on wellness, where for a lot of folks, personal training, working with a fitness professional, let's just call it that yeah. meant showing up to the gym Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and that person coaching them through a routine saying, Hey, see you next Monday. And that was the extent of the relationship. And I think really what, what's going to happen, what, what has started happening and will continue to happen is there will be mo more focus towards, hey, here's a program and a plan. I'm going to be with you side by side. We're going to look at every element of your life and make subtle improvements to that that are going to lead to goals down the road that are sustainable, that are achievable and sustainable. Yes. Y yes, and. <laughs> um, I still think so. So here's the nuance. This is a train, a question I get often. Um, so training is what you just said. Here's a plan. Here's the exercise prescription. Here's the nutritional prescription execute. Mm -hmm. That's training in my mind. Um, I think of, you know, the rock, I'm a big fan of Dwayne Johnson. Uh, when he was training for Hobbs and Shaw, he, I can't, I can't for life me think of his trainer's name, but you know, the man is 46, 47 while he was training to do fast and furious Hobbs and Shaw. Uh, if you see him in the, the scenes where he's in Samoa and he's got the you know, sarong on and no shirt, he looks incredible. But for the, I think it was seven months leading up to that scene, his trainer controlled everything about his sleep, his schedule, his nutrition, his lifts, his program. That is a trainer. Whereas a coach, you're giving guidance, you're giving information, you're asking good questions, but the client is deciding, this is what I feel like I'm ready for. This is what I want to try. Okay. Yes. I could move my bedtime up 20 minutes. No, I can't because the baby is, you know, screaming and teething right now, like, because they know their life mm -hmm. better than you know, any coach, any trainer is ever going to know that person is the one in there in that body every day. And I think that part of what we're struggling with as an industry is that trainers think they're coaching and they're not, they are still making prescriptive, like, and, and, and it's the, in, it's an industry paradigm. It's nobody's fault, but that's the way the industry was structured to make money. 
And I think what we're going to see is this unfolding of that, where the blending of training and coaching and the evolution of how these paradigms work and how we make our money and how we sustain the industry, I hope changes. It will mean for people working in corporate situations that, that those gyms are able to evolve their models so that that fitness professional as an individual has more flexibility in doing the right thing for their client. That's a big ask for gyms right now because of everything mm -hmm. going on and so much uncertainty. But I, I think that, that we're going to see a big disruption in how the industry is structured, I hope, fingers crossed, because it needs it. Do you, I, I cite this from time to time, a, a thinking back to the mid, mid late 90s, a lot of folks that, that were first being introduced into personal training, um, it was the first time they had joined a gym. Uh, the first time they had worked with a fitness professional, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen progressively over time as training coaching has become more mainstream. And certainly now in, in, in most areas of our country, as opposed to having one ma and pa gym or one big box, now they've got four or five competitors in the space. And we'll see where everything nets out here. Um, but I think many more people, a much higher percentage of people, when they go to meet with a fitness professional, they belong to health clubs in the past, belong to gyms. They've tried um, a variety of different diets over time. They got bought in on the big loser and they tried doing a hardcore or a P90X or, 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 or something progressively over time where they've made attempts. And in some cases they may have achieved some goals and reverted back up and down. Maybe they didn't before, but I think the client has become much more savvy based on experience. Very rarely, Will, will a client ever come to a personal trainer and go, yeah, I never belonged to a gym at all. I just show, showed up to the doctor and he said, hey, you got to start working out. So now I'm coming to see you. That doesn't happen nearly as much as it did 20 years ago. And I think with that, client expectations have gone up. Would you agree? I think it's that. I think it's also Dr. Google. I mean, the mm -hmm. advent of YouTube and Instagram has increased the level of information available. Mm -hmm. I think it's also increased the level of confusion available because um, it was funny with, I know you also have met Jonathan Wolf and he was on the show not long ago. And we were talking about that based off of the questions or the resistance that you get from a client, you can probably guess their age mm -hmm. because it's what, what generation of bad nutrition science were they reacting to? <laughs> so, whereas um, someone who's like my parents' age is the no fat, low fat, oh God, fat must be evil. Um, if you're a millennial, it's like carbs and you want to be paleo. Um, it's like, okay, what's, you know, with Gen Z just getting into their twenties, what nutritional nonsense are they going to be subscribing to? That's going to make them all crazy and totally misinformed. Um, but yes, I, I, I think that's the availability of information mm -hmm. that you're no longer relying on like the evening news or the newspaper or whatever your grandmother said for what you believe is good, good nutrition, good movement, good lifestyle habits. If I talked to your clients, if I picked a few of them and said, tell me what it's like to train with Darlene, what do you think they'd say? <laughs> I hope that they would say that I'm supportive and kind. Um, I think a few of them would say the phrase of, uh, she's my mirror. That's something that my clients talk about a lot, especially clients in a coaching dynamic. Um, that, you know, they'll, I'll, I'll push back on things and the phrase of like, well, I'm, I'm going to be your mirror right now and you're not going to mm -hmm. like it. Um, that's what I hope uh, that I'm patient and I make a safe space for them. I hope they like me. They probably like me because otherwise they wouldn't continue to work with me. Um, and that I hope they also would say that I'm knowledgeable, but beyond that, I don't know. I, they seem to have good experiences. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and speaking about knowledge, we're, we're talking about an industry where anybody can pop into the industry when they want to um, get a certification uh, or not, or, or, or not a pursuit of you know, some, some type of path. But um, very rarely do you see somebody who follows the pattern of going to get an undergraduate degree, pursuing a master's degree, um, especially pursuing a master's degree in positive psychology from Penn. Uh, extremely, obviously extremely unique for our industry, but also maintain that passion to work with individuals, 
not to take that background in education and just say, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to go on a speaking tour and I'm no longer a trainer or coach. I mean, I want to do those things too. That doesn't sound so bad. (laughs) But you want to combine them ultimately. I I think from our conversations before is that your motivations have been to continually work with individuals and groups. Talk a bit more about that. I get a lot out of working one-on-one with my clients. Uh, I knowledge, testing theories, um, this is the personal gratification of really meaningful relationships. I, I don't know if I've ever said this on the show before. I know I've said it on my brother's show, but um, my brother's a Twitch streamer, everybody. Go follow one peg if you're on Twitch, <laughs> place Tarkov. Um, that I believe very strongly in having a sense of purpose and meaning in what you do. And at least for the last few years, I, my purpose has been to drive, guide as many people to an actualizing life as possible. Um, you know, this like Mas, you know, classic Maslow concept of a self-actualizer, you're living in the world, um, in the moment that you're in feeling like you're able to completely be yourself and that you've got a life that really works for you and you have roles in your life where you're meaningfully contributing to people who matter to you and they're also able to co-support you. It's a reciprocal exchange. You have what you need to, to thrive. And I believe my purpose is to guide as many people to an actualized state as possible. So working one-on-one gives me the opportunity to do that in a really intimate way that then informs everything else that I do so that the other things that I do, the writing, the speaking, the podcast, there is a lot of bullshit out there by people who aren't boots on the ground. It's all theory. They're not being transparent about that. Um, or it's done in, it's done in studies that are, you know, 20 people and we call it evidence-based practice, but it was only 20 people. And those 20 people were all white and in their twenties. So like, and college students. Um, and, and so if I'm actually out there working with people and helping people, I'm, I'm getting something for me and I'm getting way better information to then carry forward to whatever else I'm making in the world. Um, cause one of the things, uh, man person calls it being a charlatan that there's so many charlatans in the industry. And of course he was one of the senior trainers at the gym that I started in. So when I stepped in, it's funny now to look back and see that he was the trainer I wanted to be like when I was new because he was so smart and so knowledgeable. And he just understood so much about how the body worked. Um, and the one thing I never wanted to be was a charlatan. (laughs) And I still carry that fear in me of like, but what if I'm just a charlatan? (laughs) The, um, so, and, and interesting for you to put that passion into words, but would you say that's that's been a passion or, or that has compelled you for a considerable period of time? Like when you when you look at your career pathway, your education pathway, at what point did you recognize that, hey, this is something I want to do. I want to work with individuals. I want to help improve their lives, et cetera. Yeah. You want this? You want the story? Is that what you're Please. fishing for? Sure. Um, so I my undergraduate degree is in acting and costume technology. Um, I grew up rural, poor first person in my family to finish a four-year degree. I can remember being five years old and wanting to be on Sesame Street. I wanted Mm -hmm. to move to New York City and be on television. And that's what I really thought, like, that's what I'll do. And I was a singer. Um, Even though I'm physically a giant, I'm I'm an E over C soprano. (laughs) So everything that's written for sopranos is like these little tiny ingenue, like that, that range, my natural singing voice range is like this. There's just no roles. (laughs) So I couldn't make it a musical theater. Um, I thought, okay, I'll be, I'll be a straight theater actor. And then eventually I tried to do film and television, but I'm really, I'm just difficult to cast. I don't fit anywhere. And this is before orange is the new black is before. So I was having a really difficult time um, making it as an actor, but concurrent with that, I played rugby in college. I sustained some significant injuries in looking back in high school, basketball and volleyball as well. But it was just like tape it and keep playing was always the mentality because the family I grew up in, everybody's hurt all the time. And I, I didn't know then what was coming, which was when I was 23, I was diagnosed with a connective tissue disorder. It means that the collagen fibers in the connective tissue that support my joints aren't long enough to overlap like someone who's genetically normal. So I dislocate and tear much easier than other people. 
and I'd had a period that I was sedentary in my freshman year of college where I'd had some significant muscle atrophy. And then I went right into playing rugby and started dislocating. So I, it was, I mean, regularly in a game, I would dislocate my left shoulder and pop it right back in and keep playing. Cause I just thought that was normal. Um, that same season, both my arches collapsed. I stepped out of my boots, my, my sneakers for rugby and my arches just fell. I fell to the ground, waited for the spasm to stop, got up and kept going. Cause I just thought, like, oh, everybody else is falling apart too. Mm-hmm. And when I was 23, my then husband, because of course, who doesn't get married when they're a senior in college? Um, he made a, I made a crack about getting older and my joints hurting. And he's like, I'm not in pain all the time. You should probably go talk to a doctor. I was like, oh, really? You're not in pain all the time? That's weird. Um, and that's when I learned that not everyone is in constant pain. <laughs> and I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and essentially told at that moment at 23 that I should prepare myself for a sedentary lifestyle where I would get progressively worse. And the physical therapist, when I was like, okay, how soon can I get back to like rock climbing and like being a badass? Uh, she told me in the intake, she's like, you're never going to run again. You're never going to, you know, and she just started ticking off all these things that I was never going to do again. And she's like, you really need to lower your expectations. And so I fired her on the spot. I just left. And I went back to my orthopedist and said, um, if you can't, like, I know the insurance, because my husband was in grad school, so we were on the school insurance at Yale. Um, I was like, if you, if there's no other physical therapist I can work with, we have a, we have a problem. And I am not working with someone who doesn't believe that I can get better. And so this was 13 years ago and you couldn't just Google it. Like there was nothing out there. So it began this process of trial and error of, okay, let's do a little bit, a little bit more than we did yesterday and see if you dislocate. Oh, you dislocated. You did too much. Try again. Um, and just to give a little scope, like if I wanted to go to the bathroom at night, I had to put sneakers on and I couldn't carry the weight of my left arm at my side without my shoulder joint starting to slide out of the socket. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would walk around with my thumb in my bra all the time. Uh, my hands were going numb pretty much every day and I was sewing for a living. So that was a big problem. Um, I was often had trouble walking and it was not easy or fun. Um, that first, when I, that week I was diagnosed, I had 26 plate of x-rays, two MRIs, and I had to have one reparative surgery because the connective tissue was too far gone in my wrist. So I had to have it repaired um, and everything else was just rehab. So five years of just tenacity and trial and error got me to the point where I could run a 5k And, you know, anybody who's got a chronic illness knows that there's typically a fair amount of depression Mm -hmm. that can be pretty dangerous at times. Um, So there's five times that types of EDS, I have the only type that's not ever fatal, but the number one cause of death for people with hypermobility EDS is suicide. Wow. Um, Which was not easy at 24 Mm -hmm. with a new partner who's also trying to like set up his own life and his own career. But coming out of that, you know, I I got to this place where I was okay and had figured out all this stuff on my own and the acting thing wasn't working and I wasn't happy. And I was like, maybe I could help other people with stuff. And so from the jump, I only wanted to work with people with chronic illness because I knew that I would know who I'm getting all feels. Look, look what you're doing DVD. (laughs) I haven't talked about this in a long time. Um, I knew that I would know what it felt like to think you couldn't get better Mm -hmm. and to believe that it was possible. And oftentimes when I work with somebody who's got a thing that they're told you can't get any better than you are, well, I'll tell them is I I genuinely don't know, but we can try. (laughs) And there's nothing, the trying will at least keep you where you are, Sure. but I bet we could do more. Um, And part of why you know, I was saying being like the man person was when I stepped into the, to the gym, he was already doing that. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, you know, teach me sensei. Um, and so from the jump, it was people who had had eight rounds of physical therapy and were told they can't get better. And then we'd get, we'd, I've got one client who couldn't lift her hands up higher than, you know, like even at the shoulder. Um, and I've seen her scoop up her five-year-old and press her (laughs) and she was told it was impossible and she she's fine 
Um, I've worked with cancer patients on their way to death. I've worked with people with um, autoimmune diseases that they're told are incurable and we figure it out, you know, through nutritional intervention. Um, but that's really the journey. And so that drive to help came from not having professional help myself. It would be unfair to my ex-husband to not recognize that he gave me incredible support through what was felt impossible many times. Um, and that really, you know, like it was, the, it was going through the divorce. One of my friends said, take this free Yale course in positive psychology. You seem like you're really struggling. And I felt better through doing the exercises and was like, there's something to this positive psychology thing. Yeah. And that's how I found map. And that's how I ended up. And, it, and it, so it was the doing myself learning the lesson has always then turned to the lens of help. Um, the story of the purpose is that I was in, in Thailand studying yoga, meditating a lot. And I had this epiphany from the universe, which is incredibly woo woo that like, oh, this is what you're here for. You're here to unlock as to, to help nudge as many people down the path to actualization as possible. Mm -hmm. So it was just this freak thing that happened in meditation. Um, and that's, that's the long of it, not the I'm long and short. It is the long of it. <laughs> And, and as you describe your journey, as well as so many of your clients, do you find that to be a consistent theme of pessimism from the medical professionals? You won't be able to do the following, trying to set those realistic expectations? I, th I think it comes from a well-intentioned place where they yeah. have been trained to not give false hope. Yes. Um, and I have... I have compassion for that position where your job is to give bad news and you can't sugarcoat things. I think that there are some people who get way out of scope um, where they don't necessarily have a specialty. Like I'll, I'll give a personal example. Um, so one of the other types of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes affects the blood vessels, uh, the, the connective tissue that supports blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And if I were to have that type, it'd be very likely that I would die at some point in my thirties because the blood vessels that, that feed my heart would rupture and, and I'd internally bleed out, which is horrible. Mm -hmm. um, it is very unlikely that I have that type because when I played rugby, I would have been purple. Like when I, and I don't mean like normal rugby bruises. I mean, like I would get tackled and my whole arm would have been purple. Like there's no mm -hmm. way I could have played rugby. But I go to, I have to get a cardiologist screening at a regular interval, just, just to be sure. So I go to this new cardiologist and this new cardiologist, essentially when I tell him who I am, what I do, what, you know, what I have, whatever, and, and unpacking all this shit for a new doctor is always the worst. Like if you have anyone in your life with a chronic illness, the medical trauma of just having to bring someone up to speed is, is horrible. Mm -hmm. So I tell this guy what's up with me. He is like, are you sure you just don't work out too hard? Your personal trainer, you're probably overtraining. Now, this is not an orthopedist. Mm -hmm. I have an orthopedist who's confirmed diagnosis. This is a cardiologist. So he is out of scope now, questioning diagnosis. And I try to justify it. And I'm trying to do it quick because I don't want to unpack it all. It's horrible and traumatic. And and finally, I get frustrated with the guy. I was like, okay, so my seven shoulder dislocations, my torn TFC, my, and I just start ticking off the joint injuries and da, 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 da. And he's, and he's like, I don't know why you're getting defensive. Like, I get it. I get it. Clearly you have it. And I was, and I was like, well, you, you don't think I have it. So let me make sure that we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. And then he, ins like, and then he ordered a bunch of tests that were, he just wasn't, he wasn't listening to me because he was of the mind that he knew more about me than I do. Mm -hmm. And I find with many of my clients that they're, you know, they're allied medical professionals, well-intentioned, trying to cover their own asses and be direct with their patient will be out of scope. And what I always tell my clients is you find people you trust, then you do what they say. Mm -hmm. So if you meet the doctor and you don't trust him, go find someone you trust. Mm -hmm. Um, because it is well-intentioned, but they're also human. And there's great doctors and there's shit doctors, just like there's yeah. great trainers and there's shit trainers. Yeah, yeah. It's just interesting when you consider, when you hear news like, no, you need to reset your expectations. You'll never be able to do the following. It's just, it, it makes me curious. How many people take that information and have Quit. the motivation like you did? Well, well, kind of between the two. What percentage say, 
I'm not listening to that person. I'm going to go forth and prove them wrong. And what percentage, though, are, are saying, all right, well, you know what, I'm not even going to try because they're telling me that I'll never be able to do that. And unfortunately, I think there are probably more people that just say, OK, I need to be realistic. Why am I going to try to try and fight something that is inevitable? Well, and building off that, I think mm-hmm. that, that, that the medical and fitness professional professions both have this issue where they say to that person, okay, you got to completely change your diet. You got to move for two hours a day. You've got to, um, you know, change, you got to quit smoking. You've got to sleep for nine hours a night. Um, you need to, and they just start rattling off like 10 things that that person needs to change right now yeah. in order to get better, soft quotes, get better. The problem being that everything that if you know anything about behavior change, you know, that it's got to be, you got to meet someone where they are. You've got to integrate with the life they currently live and then gradually progressively change them over time. Because when this episode airs conveniently, it will be one year from the mass cultural trauma of all of us being forced to change rapidly. And what that does Mm -hmm. to a psyche, we don't like it. Rapid change is a form of trauma because we weren't meant to flip a light switch and be someone else unless we had to, to survive. Sure. So we're not taking that person who's in this, who's on the struggle bus and walking them slowly to where they feel good about the change that they're making and they feel confident and there's a sense of autonomy and choice involved and their relationships are not damaged by it versus when we just go, okay, you have to change everything right now. Mm -hmm. And now that person's miserable and they're like, well, what was the point of changing? I'm healthy, but I hate it. That's not better. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say? I know this is very general, but I know as in your profession, you consistently get people asking, what should I do? What should I do? Oh, you do this, et cetera, et cetera. What are some subtle changes? I mean, you've got to have you know, just some very generalized tips that you would provide somebody, especially let's say now as we're you know, continuing through this pandemic, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel, et cetera. What, what are two or three things that are general, but everybody could probably more, more than likely most people would benefit from hearing following 20 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a day. Mm-hmm. Moderate is going to mean different for different people. Um, but even if you are highly fit and you are working out like redlining, still find a way to get 20 minutes of moderate intensity sustained activity. And the reason is it increases your endocannabinoid receptor density, which makes you more, more sensitive to serotonin. And if we are all in this mass cultural trauma where depression and anxiety are spiking through the roof, well, then we all need more of that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for my grandmother, moderate intensity, 20 minutes is like walking to the end of the driveway and back She's in her eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, for my boyfriend, it's gotta be running. Cause like he's of a higher, you know, cardiovascular fitness, but just finding that that's like step one. Yeah. Um, eating green leafy vegetables of some kind three servings a day which is probably more than most people would recommend at the jump but the Mm -hmm. reason is that it feeds the bacteria in your gut that reduce inflammation uh and improve overall health and would improve your insulin sensitivity that's like your sensitivity to glucose um then you're going to feel better. You're going to sleep better. You're, you're going to be pooping better. Like everything improves. And so if you're not eating any vegetables at all, start with like one serving and saute it so that it's not crushing you. Um, but you know, stage it up to three servings, Mm -hmm. dense green should be dark green. If you can, um, raw when you can stand it, which isn't going to be off the jump. A lot of people can't, can't tolerate it right now because it's not in our diets. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the first, I mean, meditation, and it does, I, I don't care what kind of, if it's a relaxation practice, if it's a, um, you know, loving kindness meditation is shown to have the best positive wellness and well being effects. But for a lot of people, it's too woo woo, it's too big of a jump. So just do the, the headspace or calm, or a client just put me on to um, Spirit, which is a black woman owned uh, mindfulness app. It's awesome. Um, mm-hmm. Stoked about that one, and she loves it. Um, and then the third, the fourth one would be some kind of practice of positive emotion. 
So this is where people are like gratitude practice or whatever. Like if that doesn't feel aligned with you, find something else. But it really is just pausing at some point every day to be like, this is the good shit. Mm -hmm. And it literally is a practice because you are trying to train your brain to think differently about your circumstances. So it could be optimism. It could be focusing on hope. It could be gratitude, just something where you are choosing to pause and feel positive to break you out of the downward cycle. Um, and hopefully, hopefully those things in combination prime an upward cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the other thing that I really try to get clients to work on is sleep. Yeah. Um, Cause it's to me, sleep and movement are the master behaviors, but it's hard for people for a lot of reasons. So that becomes a big ask. Cause it's one of our only physiological drives that you can consciously affect negatively. So like, mm -hmm. I can't make myself not be thirsty by thinking about it, but I can keep myself from sleeping by thinking about it. Mm -hmm. well, that um, makes sense. Yeah. So those are, those would, I would say be the baseline. So much of this is structure too, right? It's, it's just planning it's, and, and we talk about that, that shift in how we perceive wellness and training, coaching, pursuing fitness, et cetera. Um, and everything that you said is, is very realistic, but it, but it requires making a plan. 20 minutes of activity means I need to find that 20 minutes of time where maybe I'm walking in my neighborhood. Maybe I'm going down to the elliptical. Maybe I'm doing, you know, maybe I'm playing tennis. Maybe I'm doing something, anything to get out of that chair and move. And the vegetables, when I go to the grocery store, I've got to get them and I've got to put them in the refrigerator. And then thinking through the meditation, I, I think most people have heard this over time progressively, like, hey, there's benefit to it. But it's a, most of the people that you talk to about it, do you meditate? No, I just never, I, I never carve out the time. I don't know how to do it. I don't, it, different things to that degree. And then sleeping, you know, getting on that regular pattern. So you're not asking anybody to go beyond what their physical capabilities are to get to that point of delayed onset muscle soreness and dread. Ooh. And how could I ever maintain that? I mean, it's just very subtle, but you combine those things together. You'll achieve the results. Um, and, and the results, meaning just this overall better sense of well-being, but also, I mean, you take people, there's so many people that would think, oh, 20 minutes of activity, I'm not going to do anything, oh, vegetables, this and that. You put all of that together, and even if your goals go stretch beyond just the, um, uh, just the hey, I want to look at my scale and feel a little bit better, or I want to fit into these genes, but if you put all of these little things together, you are going to make modifications and changes, and and they, they will you know, from, from an overall well-being perspective, um, will, will get you to a place that you probably didn't think was possible. But also, I do believe that those little modifications and changes will make that scale weight look better, will make those clothes feel better, and contribute ultimately to, um, to just living a better life. Yeah. And I guess, the, let me just caveat by saying those recommendations are not intended for, I want to lose weight or change have some apex level of fitness that's for you're somebody who has been on the struggle bus for a year mm -hmm. and you want to not feel shitty right now yeah um because i think that there is a subset of people who might listen to this and say well that bar is too low that's mm -hmm. not going to do anything i'm not going to lose weight that way and I, I think that we have an obsession with weight loss that is horribly unhealthy for our culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and specifically for women. Typically though, if you saw anything about Jonah Hill in the media, the last couple of days, um, it's not just women mm -hmm. and it's causing people to starve themselves and hurt themselves. And I think if we take the focus off of that and put the focus on, Hey, you want to not feel like shit? Here's five things you can do in the next week add them in one at a time. And you're like, planning is a huge part of it. What mm -hmm. time are you going to go to bed? You have to buy the spinach while you're at the grocery store, yada, yada. Um, but they're, they're doable when you look at the day. And for most people, they're spending a couple of hours watching Netflix. You, you could have done 20 minutes of dancing in your underwear in your living room. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to leave. Like you could have done it while you were watching Netflix mm -hmm. and that would have counted and you probably would feel better, right? Like and so how do we make it doable and practical and reasonable and in the, sh and in the shape that the, the general population can do 
for what works for them and for what they want instead of the fitness industry creating this sense of alienation because like well and and you've you've quoted this statistic on the show isn't it like it's generally about was it 12 percent of a given population is has a gym membership but it's the same 12 percent that you're cutting up amongst the gym and then there's the 80 it, what what's the actual statistic I, I, I don't know. And I, I'm not sure if I'm the one that actually provided it, but there's a, <laughs> there's a, 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 you know, a, a population of health club members that has grown exponentially. Um, but there's still a, a big chunk of people that, that do not belong to a health club, even though in your neighborhood, you could look at it and be like, everybody belongs to a health club, et cetera. But the percentage of people that are actually going to that health club on a regular basis is minimal. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of people in the industry, when they look at a health club, they say, hey, how many members are there? And it's like, that's the wrong statistic, because really the statistic you should look at when you look at volume, ultimately, or success associated with the health club is how many swipes, how many people are coming in there a day. Yeah, what's your usage? Um, absolutely. Um, and, and a little tidbit that, that probably is interesting to the audience here is that people in, in my history, people used to always come up to me and say, oh, I'm your favorite health club member because I don't go to the gym. So I'm not taking up any space. I pay my dues, but I don't go to the gym. And actually it's awful because like most things in fitness, it's a referral business. If you're doing the things to make yourself feel better, look better, all these different types of things or whatever, people are going to be asking you, my gosh, you've got a glow. You know, you're moving great. You're looking great. All these different things. What are you doing? I go to this gym. I'm working with this fitness professional, et cetera. If you're not utilizing the services, you're, yeah, granted, you're paying a, you know, a, a, a monthly due associated with that membership, but you're not contributing to the greater good, which is getting results, feeling great communicating those to others and bringing other people into the, into the facility or service. Yes. So the, um, um, I think it's, it's, it's interesting when we talk about these things though, that, that I know a lot of people would look at that and be, and, and say things like I need to do more ultimately in order to be able to get to the results that I'm looking for. But I think Far too often people look past those simple things that will make a difference in, in what they're doing. I used to tell people all the time, um, people, oh, I've had, you know, I need to lose, I need to feel better, I need to do all these different types of things. And it's like, you can start by recording all your calories, like everything that you eat, just put it into a log. And it's amazing when you start writing that in and how many calories, how that shapes really what you're putting into your body. Little small things like that. I remember hearing a tip at one point that somebody had said, avoid the three whites and white bread, white rice uh, and, and full fat dairy. And it was like, if you do those three things right there, that will shape some of your patterns that will lead to you starting to feel better, looking better, different things along those lines. Just, I think there are little things that we can start doing. It isn't a complete overhaul progressively over time. Um, well, and what I, Rich, I, Rich, 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 Richie definitely said on yeah. the show, a little bit of something's better than a whole lot of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I heard something just recently, and, and I think it ties into this conversation. They were talking about um, uh, actors talking about being cast for Marvel movies and beyond and how it's just this superhuman, uh, you know, build that it, it, it takes for some of these folks to play Marvel characters in movies and how progressively these heroes on screen our expectations for them have changed progressively over time that and Steve McQueen was brought up where it was like it used to be that if you just you know you looked fairly fit that was good enough back in the day like you could be the hero in an action film just looking like a pretty normal person that looked fairly fit and these days actors now recognize the fact that the only way that they're going to get cast in one of these roles is by taking a year like you talked about with the rock where it's it's you've got to be really shredded and read it or uh, 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 shredded, and shredded. Shripped and shredded shredded and shredded in in order to meet the expectations of the director the producer and get cast ultimately yep. and mm -hmm. i i think the same I, I remember the same meme that you're talking about i think one of the comments that i saw responding to that meme was the way it's contributing to body dysmorphia in men yeah yeah. Right. So we, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. So often we talk about the maladaptive effects of our societal standards on women, mm -hmm. but now we're starting to see them start to mess with men. It's like, none of yeah. this is good for us. Yeah. But I, I, I think, I think what, what you're really pushing, which is, which is the great message is let's get beyond the aesthetics. And it doesn't matter if you're an actor trying to go for a, a major role in a film or you're just something, somebody 
looking to make positive changes in their life, that we've got to look at everything from a comprehensive, holistic perspective, right? And, and start getting away from the scale weight, getting away from the Instagram models and, and, and suggested workouts, and not trying to follow this template that's going to lead to, I want to look like you, and so I'm going to do the following in order to be able to get there. Well, and I don't, I, I think there's something to be said for, there are a certain amount of inspirational posts mm -hmm. that come out and there are some that are incredibly informative and helpful mm -hmm. for, for all of us, myself included. Um, but I think that that's somehow different than, you know, your straight grind feed of just like pictures of someone's butt. Mm -hmm. um, like that's not, I don't, I don't think that that's helping the general conversation about health and wellness. And the argument that I typically get in response is, well, that's what sells. It's like, really? Mm -hmm. Cause yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing better than fine. And yeah. I don't do any of that shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think if you scroll back, you can find one picture of my butt on Instagram. Um, <laughs> but it's cause my butt looked really good that day. <laughs> <laughs> I've left it up there for posterity. <laughs> yes. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's such the right message. And, and there are so many different um, signs out there that I've seen progressively over the last 26 years that say, this is the right perspective. We know we've pursued fitness and wellness as a general whole for a long period of time without getting lasting effects. And like every good industry, you're always looking at, okay, what contributions and then ultimately what those effects are. And I, I really truly believe that over the next five, 10 years, we've got to be doing some things as fitness professionals to address the fact that we're not making a dent in, um, in uh, the pop a population's health ultimately, and that we can be doing more. Without being, I feel like a fair amount of this episode has been talking about negative things, but I, I want to pop one more out there about yeah. the industry. And then I'm going to get off my damn soapbox about fitness, which is so much of the industry focuses on weight loss, but mm -hmm. when you look at the, the, the longitudinal studies, right? The studies that follow people along, along longer time horizons to see how they do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say possibly your most accessible example is you brought up, um, um, biggest loser. Yeah. So people that lose significant amounts of weight after 18 months, if you look back, at, at their trajectory, they end up heavier than when they started, even if they were successful. And it's because the typical, in my opinion, it's because the typical industry prescriptions that lead to that weight loss are doing metabolic damage um, and calorie restriction. And because you're calorie restricting with high intensity cardio, instead of building up a sustained metabolism and then allowing it to do its thing, focusing more on body composition instead of on scale pounds, um, that person's weight then shoot back up, even if they continue eating under restricted caloric intake because of the metabolic damage. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we are hurting people and we don't want to be honest about it. Um, and it is a huge problem in my mind and heart in the industry because it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this way. There are other ways to help people. Um, I also think that by bootstrapping a protocol to someone who is emotionally, socially, environmentally not aligned with that behavior, you're, it's a form of trauma, right? This person is like working out to exhaustion, eating in ways they don't like, they feel alienated from the people they love. And even if they sustain it and then the weight comes back on, now that person is socially, emotionally traumatized because what's wrong with me mm -hmm. that I can't do it, that I can't, da, 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 what, what, what am I doing wrong? What's wrong with me? Um, and I, I can't tell you the number of clients that come to me in that moment. And it's, you know, there's so much more work to do than if we'd started from a place of let's help you feel good in your day-to-day -day life. Let's make sure you're eating enough to nourish your tissues and let's build up a metabolism that we then see the weight come off because now your metabolism is stoked and it's a completely different lens and you get a very different outcome. It's figuring out how to become better than fine. Right? Ah, zing. <laughs> see, this is why you were the guy. 
Well, this has been a pleasure. Is there is there anything that we didn't touch on, Darlene? Obviously, you and I, and has been proven before, can ramble and ramble on a variety of different subjects. But um, anything else that you want to cover as you talk about, uh, well, as, as the episode is dedicated to yourself, that you want to leave <laughs> listeners with? It's like the most narcissistic thing. What do I want people to know about me? <laughs> um, I think... I think that what, how I'd like to button it is to own that. I feel like I said a lot of (laughs) kind of negative, like this is what we're doing wrong. But at the Mm -hmm. end of the day, I think that the fitness industry, positive psychology, coaching, like the the overlap is in, we all genuinely want to help people. Mm -hmm. We really, really do. And I have been so fortunate as to be surrounded by professionals on, in all of these domains that are aligned in their desire to make the world better through Mm -hmm. whatever their vehicle is. And I think if we can stick to that instead of like, you know, the the bullshit ads I get on Instagram that are like, make a million dollars as a coach without having to work. It's like, no, I want to work. I want it. I want that person in front of me who I can really affect positive change in their lives in a way that they don't even know is possible. Like that is so deeply gratifying. Why would I want to have a remote program and an app that just tells them what to do instead of me? Like that's, that's nonsense. Um, and, and we can be awesome. Uh, I also want to thank, you know, a year's worth of guests and people who've supported the show. Um, I want to thank the people who have been financially supporting the show. Cause I do have some subscribers to the show who have given a little, a little kick of the money um, that has gone toward building out a website for better than fine. That's going to launch hopefully the week that this episode goes live. Uh, and that's been really exciting for me to see that the, the snowball is rolling downhill now on something that I was like, maybe 20 people will listen to this, including my mom. And now it's, <laughs> Now I have like, there are fans, there are fans of the show, like people I don't know who listen to this thing and get something out of it. And then like DM me and I'm like, oh my God, it's working. (laughs) Well, I think it ties into you prepare well. Um, And and I'm really glad we did this episode because certainly knowing um, that you've gotten to this one year point and the folks that you have on the show, great contributors, interesting content, but you also prepare very well and you steer things in a way that really provides some interesting information and and not just for somebody in the fitness industry, a fitness professional or holistic wellness uh, teacher, uh, professional, et cetera. And, um, And so I think you've teed it up for a lot of your listeners to want to know a bit more about you. So I'm really glad that we've taken this opportunity and that you've gotten to share your story and you've provided some great content. I think it's fascinating how you ended up in this place. And I think it's good for your listeners to know and then ultimately what drives you uh, going forth. So this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for, Mm -hmm. thank you for doing the thing with me. Absolutely. I'm ready for part two. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun.